Now, I have, of course, no quarrel with Mr. Ulam's evaluation of Lenin. Indeed, to look back upon October 1917 from the viewpoint of Lenin while he lay dying seems to me singularly appropriate. The October Revolution was certainly in Lenin's revolution, as few revolutions in history can claim to have an author. One could very well argue that without Lenin, Trotsky used to say, without Lenin and me. But one could argue that without Lenin, with just Trotsky, uh, this revolution would never have come to pass. So it was his own, and it was his responsibility. Still, there are some points I would like to raise. In the first, Mr. Yudam has protested elsewhere against putting Lenin alongside Stalin, and I'd suggest that the kind of justification one might put into Lenin's mind while he, was uh, while he lay dying cannot possibly be of the same kind as for Stalin. This raises a question which, uh, was, uh, um, which I had in mind while I was listening to the debate uh, after Mr. Carr's paper. I was struck, and I've been struck before, by the fact that those who are pro and con, or the both sides uh, who were here uh, debated uh, almost heatedly, that they have a, one thing in common, namely the continuity of the revolution. Uh, as in this, in, uh, that is that if you are for Lenin, you justify Stalin. If you are against Stalin, uh, uh, you throw Lenin in also. You put Lenin into the same category. You say Stalin is a necessary consequence of Lenin, whatever. Now, this is in a sharp contrast, it seems to me, to recent voices from the Soviet Union. Mr. Erickson uh, mentioned here from La Sinistra and uh, a, heat, a, row, a, a real row, a heated uh, discussion in the um, Department for the History of the Great Patriotic War, which took place in February 1960. I have this here in German, and I would be uh, trusting that all of you know German and uh, spare me the trouble of translation. I will read to you just a few sentences in, just in order to show how far away the discussion which today take place in Russia are from this, what you rightly call the mainstream of Western thought. Stalin, says one of the gentlemen, hat alle polnischen Kommunisten in der Sowjetunion erschießen lassen und die Kommunistische Partei Polens für vogelfrei erklärt. Wie kann man Kommunist sein und mit Ruhe von Stalin sprechen, der die Kommunisten verraten und verkauft hat, der fast alle Delegierten des siebten Parteikongresses und fast alle auf diesem Kongress gewählten Mitglieder des Zentralkomitees beseitigt hat, der die Spanische Republik, Polen und alle Kommunisten in allen Ländern verraten hat. In short, says another, Stalin war niemals Genosse und vor allem nicht unser. In the third one says, wir haben allen Grund zu glauben, dass Stalin nicht Regierungschef wurde, um die Verteidigung des Landes vorzubereiten, sondern um sich mit Hitler zu verständigen. These are really extraordinary words from a Soviet gremium. And uh, I quote them in order to say, Lenin, rightly or wrongly, might have believed they have laid the foundations for a long process, and to project his dream into the future was not against letter or spirit of Marxism. But even if Stalin could conceivably justify his criminal course in liquidating the peasant class, and I sympathize here with what Mr. Kennan has said so eloquently the other day, it's one of the great unsung tragedies of this uh, century, which was unfortunately rich in tragedies. How could Stalin have been able to justify the liquidation of the party bureaucracy, the perfectly loyal communist of other countries, the Red Army, and uh, in addition, all the crimes which I just quoted from the 
So I don't think that even in the cautious way in which Mr. Ulam did it, that even this cautious way is uh, open to question. My second point is that Mr. Ulam said that Lenin's opponents were helpless because he still lived in the 19th century, which uh, with World War I had just come to an end. I happen to think that other characteristics mentioned here repeatedly, apathy, inactivity, lack of will, but above all, fear, actual fear of responsibility, were more potent factors. But I also think that Lenin himself was still a child of the 19th century. Thought, though of course stripped of much of its sentimentality, didn't he seriously think that in the society of the future you would be able to do without a penal code, since under normal, that is socialist conditions, men wouldn't know how to behave themselves according to the few moral rules known since times immemorial? And every citizen would come to the help of his fellow citizens in case someone demented should attack him, just as a man comes to the help of a woman who is molested in the street. This strikes me as a 19th century mentality, and I think there's much on Lenin to back it up. But to come back to the ascendancy of Lenin over all his opponents, inside as well as outside his party, I think if some of us here agree that revolutions are not made but happen, and that the decisive question usually is who, if anybody, steps into the power vacuum created not by conspiracy but by the disintegration of the preceding regime. Mr. Ulam said in his book that the Bolsheviks, this very marvelous book, The Bolshevik, which actually is about Lenin, that the Bolsheviks did not seize power, they picked it up. And this is entirely right. The point is that Lenin was almost the only one willing to pick it up, which means to assume responsibility. And since this was not correct, according to the Marxist timetable, why did it happen? I would suggest that the main reason was that Lenin alone among the revolutionaries had very early understood the modern interconnection of war and revolution. He had learned the lesson of the first Russian revolution of 1905 and perhaps of the French Commune as well when defeat in war had touched off revolutionary events in which the weakness of the regime, which otherwise might have lived on for considerable periods, suddenly was exposed. He alone had welcomed the outbreak of the Great War, and he expected this century to be a century of wars and revolution, as you remember, he said very early during this war. Anyhow, he associated a world war with world revolution. He may not have seized power had he not hoped. Revolutions in Western Europe would follow. And the elite, he predicted, as Mr. Ulam quoted pretty accurately, new revolutions of yet unknown character in the East. Of course, he was wrong in the short run. He has been proved partly right, at least, to a considerable extent in the long run. And I'd suggest that it was this insight, not to be found in either Marx or Engels, which gave him the necessary confidence for the on s'engage et plus en voie. He had been prepared, I would suggest, where the others were not. My next point concerns the Soviets. Mr. Ulam is of course right, the term became almost meaningless in a very short time, but I feel he forgot to add that it was far from meaningless until Lenin had done quite a bit in order to make it meaningless. Now, quite apart from the real conflict between the Soviets and the new party, apparatus, Kronstadt, etc., he was greatly bothered by the problem of dual power. And here I'd suggest that he was very much a Marxist, and more generally a European in the continental, non-Anglo-Saxon sense. 
that power is indivisible, that it must be centralized, that the separation or division of powers weakens powers. All this belonged to the political staple, not only of the revolutionary, not only of Marx, of course, but of nearly all political theorists and statesmen in Europe, with the great exception of Montesquieu, who, as we all know, became influential, not in France, but in the American Revolution. Also, without denying the anarchist tendency in the Soviets, I'd like to stress once more that the Soviets had been organs of order rather than of action. We heard here enough from uh, Mr. Ferro and Mr. Anweiler uh, uh, about uh, the Soviet resolutions for constitute. Constitute, uh, constituent assembly to support this point. I don't want to go into it. My next point, I would not deny is the attrition of Marxism under Stalin, but I wonder if this process began already under Lenin. The dictatorship of the proletariat in Lenin's view, a dictatorship of the party as its vanguard, was still in accordance with Marx, I think, since the very word dictatorship, taken of course from the, Rush, from the Roman usage, was meant to indicate its provincial, provisional character and was still understood in this original Roman sense at the time. I would argue, I'm afraid, here somewhat seriously at odds with Mr. Ulam's book on Lenin, that Lenin's handling of the all-important question of state and political power was very much in agreement with Marx and his own theoretical view in the matter in state and revolution. For Marx, as for Lenin, the state consisted of police and army the means of violence to watch over laws which were made for the benefit and meant to serve the ruling class. I quote, as long as there is a state, there is no freedom. When there is freedom, there will be no state, as Lenin put it. When Lenin called, therefore, Russia the freest country in the world, I'm afraid he actually meant that it was a country without government. Hence, when Lenin finally understood that he himself would need a government, he proclaimed in his polemics against uh, Kautsky in 1918, a power, I quote, seized by force and restrained by no law. This was precisely what he understood by state power, namely a coercive apparatus uh, where the laws were only a kind of hypocrisy. And since he did not understand power, as I believe, and Marx didn't understand power, or especially state power either, the, uh, Marx has hardly bothered to uh, think about uh, this matter, he sincerely and finally, I think, desperately believed that it could be checked, power, uh, and restrained by discipline and revolutionary morality. In short, it was because he shared Marx's anarchistic estimate of state power that his government uh, turned immediately into an apparatus of oppression. However, uh, confronted with the reality of Russia, Lenin added one important thought to the essentially Marxian estimate of the role of the state. He held in State and Revolution, and I quote, that the proletariat needed state power, the centralized, again centralized, organization of power, an organ of violence, all the same not merely in order to suppress the resistance of the exploiter, but also, and this is new, in order to guide the immense masses of the people, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, the half-proletarians, half in the task of getting the socialist economy going. 
This was essentially the same function the party had had with regard to the working class prior to the seizure of power. Except, of course, that now the party had coercive power to fulfill this function, which, of course, changes everything. They are no longer representative, really. In other words, there was a positive function of this course of power, an eminently practical one if it should work, except that from this viewpoint, it looked as though Russia was not so much skipping the capitalist stage as Marx had hoped, as going through that stage of enlightened despotism with its mercantile systems now called state capitalism, which had preceded the capitalist development in Europe and been abolished by the French Revolution. Before Stalin established his totalitarian rule, Lenin had erected a kind, surely without knowing it, I think, of enlightened absolutism. Now, the trouble with enlightened despotism has always been the scarcity of enlightened despots. Uh, despots are seldom enlightened because enlightened men have no appetite for this kind of power. But the very fact that Lenin on his deathbed thought of nothing but of personalities, of, his, of the personalities of his successors, proved that he must finally have grasped this simple fact, however vaguely and crudely. And this is all the more impressive as his ideological, ideological conviction should hardly have permitted him to waste the precious time left to him, he knew he was dying, on the subjective factor which they all held, had held in such contempt. It is indeed ironical, and if one has any sympathy with Lenin, as I have, a bit sad that a movement which had staked everything on objective development should have established a kind of government in which everything finally depended upon the future ruler, for whom not even a law of succession exists. So that this, so that Lenin should now be reduced uh, to awkwardly, I think the awkwardness in these last things is very striking, imploring the comrades to show more discipline and deploring the lack of culture in general and the rudeness of Stalin. What an understatement, the understatement of the century in particular. Finally, the question of the attraction of communism <coughs> I agree with you and would only like to add two points which make the outlook a bit less rosy. The extraction in Europe today is very strong in all countries which want a new order of things. That is a revolution, of course. Something that would change. A new order of things is in. Well, a term of Machiavelli, who also was longing for a new order of things and wise enough to say nothing is more fraught with danger than the establishment of a new order of things, which at the same time he passionately wanted. If he is the father of anything, he is the father of the revolution. Well, not necessarily these people a communist order. The communist parties attract what we here call the disaffected members of society and also those workers, especially in Italy and France, who are convinced that they see a communist party as the strongest <coughs> factor in the improvement of living conditions for them. They don't want necessarily a communist regime, but a strong communist opposition to whatever government there may be. I would not think this state of affairs particularly dangerous if I had more trust in the stability of European governments. But this, I suppose, is a large question and much open to controversy. Potentially more explosive is a fusion of nationalism and communist communism in the underdeveloped countries because there the exploitation of men by men is still as powerful a point of crystallization as it originally was when Marx wrote the capital. The beacon of hope 
is there now what it once was <coughs> in the West and what Saint Just has said briefer and perhaps more impressive than Marx. Les malheureux sont la puissance de la terre. Now, everything we know of history refutes this statement. No revolution was ever been made by the malheureux, by, the mis by those who were miserable. But this does not prevent it, I think. Les malheureux sont la puissance de la terre. It does not prevent it from being very attractive.